Welcome to Danger, Social Media and Kids. I'm Carla Hill. Social media has become a huge part of our children's lives, but concerns are growing about what too much time spent on social media is doing. Recently, the U.S. Surgeon General issued this warning in response to the question, is social media safe for my kids? The answer is that we don't have enough evidence to say it's safe, and in fact, there is growing evidence that social media use is associated with harm to young people's health. Let's repeat that. The Surgeon General, the top medical official in the U.S., says there is growing evidence that social media use is associated with the harm of young people's mental health. That is amazing. We have a great panel of experts to talk about this shocking statement, the evidence that supports it, and what we as parents, educators, therapists, medical professions, and loved ones can do about it. Joining us is Dr. Khadija Booth Watkins. She's the Associate Director of the Clay Center for Young Healthy Minds and also the Interim Director for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Residency Training at Massachusetts General Hospital. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Watkins. And now for children, um, sorry, excuse me, we also have Dr. Lori Sutton, who's a psychiatrist and retired Brigadier General in the Army and also Miss Emma Benoit. She's a suicide survivor and youth advocate and speaker, as well as our other guest, Dr. Scott Poland, is a professor in the College of Psychology and the director of the Suicide and Violence Prevention Office at Nova Southeastern University. And joining me in the studio is Dr. Latoya Lewis, an associate professor at the University of Miami School of Nursing and Health Studies. Dr. Lewis, thank you for joining us. Welcome to all. Thank you so much. So let's dive right in. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, up to 95% of teenagers use a social media platform. 40% of younger children are on social media, and a third of teenagers use social media almost constantly. Dr. Watkins, I'd like to begin with you. How much time on social media is too much time for young people? Well, thank you for having me here to be part of this important conversation. And this is a question that so many caregivers want to know. They want a concrete answer. And there are numbers out there to suggest, you know, kids under two should have zero time. Um, two to five should be no more than an hour. And kids between two to, uh, and kids older than that should really have no more than two hours. But I really like to think about this in terms of a kid specifically, because all kids are different, their temperaments are different, their, their tolerance is different, and also all screen time is not created equal, and so screen time can be used for different things, and so we really need to think about this um, specifically about the kid, and is social media getting in the way of them being able to go to school, go to sleep, keep up with coursework? Is it getting in the way of them engaging in social activities, extracurriculars, spending time with family? Um, also to think about, is it changing them? Is it making them moody, cranky, irritable, unhappy, um, making them anxious? And so these are the things that I think we should be thinking about as we think about how much time should govern each child individually. I think it is a little bit risky to think about a broad stroke and give a solid concrete number because all kids are different. Thank you for that, Dr. Watkins. And Dr. Poland, what are some of the mental health issues associated with overuse of social media? <laughs> Well, that Surgeon General's report said that social media is wrecking havoc with our children's lives, interfering with sleep, interfering with their concept of themselves, making them think they're not smart enough, they're not rich enough, they're not good enough. And in particular, it impacts girls more than boys. And very specifically, it is resulting in increased anxiety, depression, for our youth. And I'm really glad that Dr. Watt bleepish because too many young people go to bed is under their pillow and they're awakened in the middle of the night. I want to focus on Emma. Uh, when you were a teenager, were you aware of how social media could affect your mental health? Not at all. I was completely naive and unaware of the real harms and dangers 
consuming just on my cell phone um, in terms of exposure and content and you know the the how often I was on social media throughout the day um, I was truly completely unaware of what it was doing to not only my mental health but also in a way my physical health um, like they mentioned it did really affect my sleep patterns and in turn my sleep patterns were affecting my school and my academics so it did trickle its way into pretty much every major aspect of my life and it really negatively affected me and I was completely unaware of the real dangers that it does have. Oh my goodness, it seems so subtle. Dr. Sutton, what about younger children, those who aren't yet in middle school or high school? Is the risk of harming their mental health the same or greater than teenagers? Well, Carla, thank you so much for that question because a lot of attention is paid to the teenagers, the adolescents. Less, less is really talked about with the younger kids. Uh, I don't a young child that is four years old is a very different state of neurodevelopment than even a seven or eight or a ten or eleven year old child. But we, we are getting research that is now showing that you know, excessive exposure to social media and screen time is changing the development of the brain, the structure of the brain. Mm. Uh, the brain. And that worries me a lot for young kids. It also worries me, you know, since the pandemic, the food industry has just gone on overdrive to present ads that Do have really Dr. Sutton, bad nutritional. I, I hate to interrupt you. You said some really important things about the brain. We had some trouble hearing you. If you don't mind repeating that. No. Oh, not a bit. No. Uh, what we're learning about the developing brain we're learning that the neurodevelopment is really altered. And of course, when we have young kids, three, four, five years old, who are on devices such as you know, 2010, um, we now know that there are changes in structure, changes in the size of the brain, uh, changes in function. That's really worrisome. But then you look at it's already but also weight, obesity. Uh, I started to mention that during the, the pandemic, children went on overdrive. And young kids are particularly susceptible. We're even having dental decay and caring in young kids because they are so susceptible to advertising the food company. So I think it's, it's equally important to be worried about the preteens as it is about the adolescents. Thank you. Yet, thank you for that response. Dr. Lewis, what have you seen about the harm that social media is causing in, in children? Excellent question. So there have been different things that have occurred with children. Part of it includes self-esteem, limited activity, as my colleagues on the panel have mentioned. It has also impacted individuals in regards to socialization. Many children have limited exposure to other children, other activities, and that has resulted in a gap which parents, healthcare providers, schools are trying to bridge that gap with socialization. In addition to that, children are learning different things through social media. Some of it is monitored and some of it isn't. So as a result of that, we're also bridging the gap between truth and fallacies of everyday life as well as different activities. And we're having a concern about controlling their learning. So social media is trying to then also infiltrate the aspect of their education in a certain way. So those are some changes that we're seeing. Thank you, and you know, a big negative is social media could lead to addictive behaviors as, as we've discussed already. Correct. Let's take a look at this video. Living Minute, a look at the latest medical innovations changing our lives. Teenagers seem to spend most of their time on social media these days, but is it addicting? Social media is at its core designed to be addicting. These billion dollar companies that run these apps and develop them actually employ psychologists and people that are 
are their whole job is to keep us engaged in whatever app or uh, a device that you're using. So if you think your child is being harmed by too much social media, what should you do? It's really hard to tell a kid to be off uh, TikTok or Snapchat when you're sitting on your phone looking and scrolling through Facebook or some of the other uh, apps that adults commonly use. And so you have to model good behavior as well. Dr. Watkins, are teens more at risk to become addicted to social media? And if so, why is that? I mean, it is incredibly, incredibly reinforcing and rewarding. And, you know, you could be on any of these platforms and scroll and never really hit the bottom and continue to find new and intriguing content. And so that in and of itself keeps you captivated and intrigued. And for adolescents in particular, they are wired to particularly seek these types of rewarding and engaging activities and not be so cued into the risks, like, uh, unlike adults can be. And so when they start to get these kind of reinforcements, they are less likely to pump the brakes and execute some restraint. And so that is what makes adolescents and young people more vulnerable um, to becoming addicted to, to social media and other things in general. But, you know, we see it's pretty addictive to, to adults as well. You can probably list a number of adults that kind of seem like the phone is Velcro to their hand. So if it's hard for adults, it's exponentially harder for teenagers. That really is the truth. We do have to watch ourselves. You know, we wanted to hear from a young person about their experience on social media. So we reached out to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, also known as NAMI, in Miami-Dade, and they connected us to Joaquin, a young high schooler. Here's what he had to say. I started using it around when I was 12 years old, until the time around COVID, when I started to use social media more and more as I had more free time. And with this came the addiction and me continuously using it as a form of short-term dopamine. And that longing for it led me to become more addicted and just like wanting to use it a lot. So that experience was bad for me. Any time I could find to use my free time, I would mainly use it just for um, content moderation and just viewing social media. It had been a form of escapism where I could um, use all the time I have that is my free time and just use it on uh, social media. And every time I used it, I saw myself not realizing the time that had gone by, which made me become way less productive, especially over my time. We were all going back to school and uh, things like that. I had occupied my time with other things like sports and schoolwork and friends. So with me replacing that main form of entertainment and stimulation, I had replaced it with a more productive and efficient and beneficial form of uh, stimulation and content for me. Emma, why do you think young people find social media so irresistible? I think there are a couple of different factors. One, the, like he said, the dopamine, right? It's addictive to scroll and to get that interaction and to get that validation from your peers and honestly from strangers on the internet. You know, it's, it's a good way to kind of have that short-term satisfaction. And when you are a youth and you are dealing with boredom as, you know, developmentally human beings will have to deal with boredom, as boredom, boredom. Um, you know, when you're a youth, it's just an easy, an easy, very accessible means of fulfilling that time and fulfilling that board at boredom. Um, I also think one of the reasons why it is so addicting to youth and adolescents is because of the kind of the, I guess nowadays our youth are really kind of building an identity and a self image around their online presence and the kind of validation and reception that they're getting from their peers through social media apps like TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram. And so it's really about, you know, the validation that they're seeking as well as kind of the identity that they feel they have based on their online presence. So I think those two factors alone is a big reason as to why our youth are mentally addicted to this device and to these apps. And it's because of those things from my perspective and experience. And Dr. Poland, when people think about addiction, they usually think about drugs and alcohol use. 
But how is social media in the same in terms of the, how is it the same in terms of addiction? Well, you mentioned the release of dopamine, which is associated with pleasure. There's the habit that gets formed after we do something for approximately 29 days in a row. And it's compelling, even if some of the messages they're receiving don't make them feel that good about themselves. It's like they have to check and see what's happening. And I had a chance just a week ago to talk to high school students. And I think we need to understand as adults, we really were not raised in the world they're living in right now. So what did I say to them? I asked, do you ever feel like you're missing out on some things you want to do? And the answer was, well, yes, not enough exercise, missing sleep, maybe not developing in-person capabilities of interacting with others. I think about the only message we can have is just be mindful and think about how the social media is starting to consume your lives and think about being more planning about how you use it. Consider some blackout periods and modeling was mentioned. You know what I sometimes hear from moms? I know the value of a technology-free meal, but I can't get my husband to put down his phone. And so that modeling really, this technology is consuming all of our lives, but most of it is that of our young people. Dr. Lewis, this is a new area of practice that you're probably teaching your students at UM mm -hmm. as they go into nursing. What do you say? How can you tell if your child is addicted to social media? So there are some things that parents or any adults can observe. So we're observing changes in behavior. There are individuals that are becoming anxious when they're not with the particular device. You're seeing decreased motivation to participate in various activities. You're seeing limited excitement or enjoyment with activities that are not related to technology. We might see changes in the child's behavior at school. You may hear certain behaviors in regards to school performance, academics. So those are just to name a few. In addition to that, some psychological elements can include reduced self-esteem based on them modeling or seeing other behaviors on that technology. And that can also trigger a warning signal for you that their behavior, their personality, their self-esteem has also transitioned. You know, Dr. Watkins, we are talking about social media and we're kind of thinking about maybe one aspect, but what about gaming online? A lot of teens play games on their phones or computers and it can be a way for gamers to connect socially, but it can also go very wrong. What's your advice on this? So my advice is typically going to start with having these conversations with your kids early, even before they start doing online games, talking to them about again, online safety, you know, knowing uh, about healthy relationships, because again, these are people that they're playing with online, typically um, can be people that they associate with at school. So making sure that they are feeling as though that they're treated kindly and with respect and talking to them about what that means and also what to do if they do feel unsafe or they feel mistreated. Um, I think some of the other conversations that we need to have is really a, with parents about being present and actively engaged and not being kind of hesitant to ask questions. You know, what games are you playing? Who are you playing with? How can people join in games with you? Is it just people you know or can strangers join in with you? You know, what kind of things are you guys talking about? I also think it's really, really important to have uh, be present when they're playing games with the headphones off, especially when they're getting started so that you can actually hear these conversations and take these opportunities to have teachable moments, whether in real time or you know after the fact. But you can you'll be surprised about some of the conversations that are had, some of the language that's had, you know, and have real conversations with your kid. Like, did you hear when someone so said X, Y, and Z? What did you think about that? How did that make you feel? It's really about kind of these ongoing conversations and these teachable moments and making it become natural and just part of your everyday kind of how we check in with, with each other. Indeed, you know, there are many other dangers for teens and children down the social media path. And we asked Michelle, a presenter for the Ending the Silence program for youth and also a volunteer for NAMI Miami-Dade to tell us about her experience. When I was 12, this was around 17 years ago and it was the beginning of 
Facebook when I started using social media. So all my friends were on it and it was like the thing to do after school where we post our pictures and it was nice just to see what everybody else was doing. I had a really bad experience at the beginning because someone in my class, in my school, used my picture and create a fake profile of me with my name and everything. And back then, it wasn't like a common thing to do. So people believe if they see like a profile of you, they believe it was you. And this person was texting other people in my class and, and in the school and in my neighborhood, like if it was me. And then I feel like, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know who to go. I didn't want to go tell my par- my mom or my dad, like, hey, this is happening because I was embarrassed. Like, it was my fault because I put my picture at some point in, in this platform and then somebody else used it. I will tell young people that be careful in what they believe. Be careful in what who they follow, because sometimes we feel forced to follow certain people that drains our energy, that we don't like to see that person. And the unfollow button is there for us to use. So be careful with the energy that you spend there. Be careful with what you believe and still have time to have real social connections. We cannot lose that sense of like a friend going and and hang out with her friends in real life, going to the movies, stuff like that. Uh, Social media is not a replacement of that. Michelle's story is very compelling. Uh, Dr. Poland, she told us that she found out that it was a classmate who made the fake profile. Why would teens do something like that? Well, I'm so sorry that happened to Michelle. And I had a chance with a large group via Zoom this week. And basically, the internet, we should approach it like when our kids are learning side by side with them every single step of the way. And I think the technology has to be approached as a privilege, right? And if the parents of the other child had been paying attention, maybe Michelle would not have been exposed to that. I'm also really worried that we don't have enough kindness, we do not have enough empathy in this world, and some of this has to start with our national leaders. One thing to disagree with the policy it's something else to attack somebody as a person. So if this happening at state and national level, well, of course we would expect this meanness and lack of empathy and kindness to impact our young people as well. I want to go back to Dr. Sutton. Um, Michelle says she didn't know how to handle the situation. What would you, what would your advice as a doctor be for someone like Michelle? Well, let me start out by saying, you know, reflect for a moment on the wisdom of the voice of young individuals like Michelle, like Wally, like Emma, like these uh, teenagers that are schooling to talk about. You know, we have so much to learn from this generation. And I think that what Michelle did is she described a process which she uh, recognized there was a uh, As a physician, I, I would want to you know, find out, for example, there's a whole movement of push about digital detox. You go online and say digital detox for families or for teenagers or for kids. You do a whole host of strategies that you can use to limit your, your exposure and you want to put the legislation for the smart act with the social media and discussion technology. This legislation is required to provide user consent in the endless scrolling that you can play, be able to uh, uh, really provide users with the ability to monitor and self-regulate so there are, are things afoot that are resources, but we need to, I share the worry that's been expressed by a member of the panel, that we don't know enough, as the first general said, and, you know, think of it, we regulate alcohol and cigarettes, gambling, and drugs, and even food ingredients and calories. Why wouldn't we find a better way to regulate social media when the evidence is starting to really 
Thank you so much, Dr. Sutton. Emma, high school, this is closer to you than any of us here. What or how would you suggest Michelle handle the situation, maybe if she was one of your friends? Oh boy, I actually had a very similar experience to Michelle when I was in middle school. Um, a very similar experience. A friend of mine made a, an account with my with my pictures, and so the way that I was instructed to handle it was take it to authorities because um, essentially that is you know something that they can help you with if it is becoming something that is you know endangering your your well being. Then um, you could definitely take it to authorities, and that's kind of what we did. Um, but outside of that, just for her emotional and mental you know status after experiencing something like that. I would encourage her to kind of lean into what she said that she did in terms of monitoring who she follows and really becoming intentional of not only the content that she's engaging with, but also the accounts and the creators that she's choosing to give her time to. Um, I think that's really important that we advocate for our youth to be very intentional with who you're following, because I believe that social media, while it has harmful and negatives, it also has positives. There are countless positive accounts that create really inspirational and affirmational content that can be consumed by our youth that can really encourage them and give them a sense of self image. So I encourage them to really be intentional about those things when it comes to social media. And Dr. Watkins, I want to talk about another dangerous but very common situation where a teen may be befriended by someone who's actually an adult impersonating another teen. It's called catfishing, but can you explain what this is and how children can protect themselves? So catfishing is exactly that when an adult typically, and, and as we see, it can also be done by your peers, but when an adult typically pers impersonates or tries to come off as a child or a young person to befriend a teen or, or a young person to try to um, you know, gain their trust, and usually there, there are kind of an end goal to really get something out of them, whether it is to uh, get money, to get inappropriate pictures, to try to lure them out and meet them somewhere. And again, this really goes back to sounding like a broken record, the, the conversations, the constant conversations about internet and online safety, talking to your, to your young person about, you know, not giving out your personal information, not befriending people who you don't know, um, being mindful to report if anything seems suspicious or unsafe and if people do somehow get into your space being being diligent about deleting them and blocking them is really really important but but also just talking to them about the idea of catfishing in general to let them know so that they don't fall victim because some of these people can be really persuasive and talk about some of the, the signs like people who are typically trying to catfish usually don't have much on their you know profile about their personal information they usually have few friends and followers um, they typically don't have like lots of candidates because these are shots typically that they, that they took offline. So just kind of give them an idea of what to be looking for so that they can be armed. Um, but also again, making sure they know how to be safe uh, should they find themselves in a predicament where they feel like they are, you know, being catfish. Um, it's really, really important. And again, monitoring with them, going alongside with them, looking at their social media accounts, helping them to point out and identify. You know, if you happen to see one on your account, go to them and show them, like, look, this is what a catfishing looks like. This person doesn't have any information. They probably, you know, they don't have any friends. This is not someone I'm going to friend, and I'm actually going to block them. All really important points. And I want to go back to something that Emma mentioned. I want to take a moment and let our viewers know if a child has been threatened or coerced into sending explicit images of themselves, contact your local FBI office or call 1-800-CALL-FBI to get help. Suicide among teens is another crisis in this country and we know social media can affect a young person's mental health. Before we get into the discussion, I'd like to show you the trailer for a documentary about Emma's journey as a suicide survivor. If Emma Benoit is gone, then she's gone, and that's it. Now my mom was there. Oh my God! My daughter shot herself. They said, "I may walk, or I may not." A local teen who lived to talk about her suicide attempt is sharing her story with the world. Maybe this is my calling. Maybe my pain and suffering can help someone else. I have this weird feeling. It's called hope.
dilemma so personal. Uh, thank you for putting this out in the world. I want to ask, what role did social media play in your experience, and what advice do you have for other kids? And what about advice for their parents and their loved ones? Social media played a huge role. Social media was really somewhere that I went to seek that validation, and comparison was a huge aspect in terms of how it affected my mental and emotional well-being. And I would encourage our youth to again, be intentional and be mindful of not only how much content you're consuming, but whose content you're consuming. That is something that I regret looking back. Obviously hindsight is 2020 and knowing what I know now, I would do things a lot differently, but I would encourage parents to kind of take the advice of Dr. Watkins in the sense of, you know, being um, open and candid with your own social media and the way that you handle friend requests from people that you don't know and really kind of holding their hand um, as they navigate social media because it is an un it is a new world and it's kind of uncharted territory for a lot of us. So I would encourage parents to be super diligent with helping and supporting their youth and monitoring their accounts. Um, and I would encourage the youth to do the same for themselves. I create, um, there are things on your phone where you can create um, timers essentially so I have one on my phone and it basically just kind of limits the amount of time that I can spend aimlessly scrolling so that would be my advice and dr. Poland uh, in your practice what role does social media play in the suicide crisis what is your observation Carla well, think important subject and and I wrote my first book on youth suicide in 1989 Currently, it's the second leading cause of the youth risk behavior surveillance survey data. If we just specifically talk about Florida, found that 8.9 school students in our state made a suicide attempt in the last 12 months. Line is we're afraid to talk about suicide prevention. We need to be comfortable bringing it up. We need to recognize we're never in the head of a teenager, when you bring it up, it actually gives them a chance to burden themselves and gives us a chance to talk about using 988 and the crisis text line. And we all need to be alert for events. What I mean by that is that the teenager died for a while. Something happens today that causes them to take action. Most commonly, that's a severe argument with parents relationship, severe humiliation, or a severe discipline problem, and cyberbullying. Sometimes I'll hear, oh, it was only one thing posted online. It was nasty, it was humiliating, but it was only one thing. But wait a minute, 28 different kids piled on and added to it. And it is so important that every teenager listening to this identify a go-to trusted adult Teens always talk to their peers about their suicidal plan. Peers must step forward and get adult help. And you know, Dr. Lewis, this is a very serious topic, obviously, but mm -hmm. the statistics also show that these suicidal ide ideation affects girls more than boys. Yes. Any idea why that might be? Well, it depends also on the patient's age group. So in regards to this process, we're also looking at cyberbullying regarding different peer pressure elements, cyberbullying, as my um, panel colleagues mentioned, about other aspects of imitation, comparison. Um, it also ties into different aspects of why this is happening, what is happening in regards to different social groups, different social cues. And other aspects that relate to this is cyberbullying, and cyberbullying can happen in small microaggressions in different groups. So it can happen with athletic groups, it can happen on other social groups, or it can happen just in a general classroom. So we need to look and assess and 
teenage, preteen girls, and even younger are more prone to this because they are transitioning in development. They are transitioning in regards to self-esteem. And those aspects, if you address their personality, their behavior, and fine-tune different aspects of their body and transitions, those are different cues to then trigger different bullying with these patients. And, and Dr. Watkins, in your view, what are some of the warning signs that a young person may be at risk for a suicide attempt? This is a great question because it's so important for us to know what to look for and when we need to be worried. And, and some of the early warning signs are really major changes in behavior. So major changes in mood. They're depressed, they're not eating, they're not sleeping. Um, they become more isolated and withdrawn. They don't want to hang around friends. They don't want to hang around family. Um, they're no longer kind of performing, um, you know, well in the things that they used to perform well in, whether it's academics or sports. Um, other things that, that can be signs are um, they no longer have interest in things, doing things that they usually love to do, whether it's, um, again, it could be eating, it could be talking on the phone, watching TV. And so these are early signs. Uh, some specific things to, you know, cueing you into they may be thinking about not wanting to live is specifically talk about not wanting to live, talking about wishing they were dead, talking about a life that doesn't include them. Um, they could be do, they could start doing things like preparing themselves, like getting rid of things, gifting things away, some of the things that they really, again, are, that are near and dear to them. And sometimes kids will also write letters, like almost like farewell letters. So all of these things are, are signs, but usually what I say to parents is any really ma major change in behavior is something to be concerned about, and these are just kind of a list of some of them. Yes, and sometimes teens feel like they can't talk to their parents. Mm -hmm. But as this video shows, it's important for friends to support each other. Me and my best friend and my cousin, the way that we all check on each other, like I'll probably send somebody a funny meme or somebody will send me a funny meme or they just randomly call me and we'll start talking about one thing but the conversation will end up probably where you really wanted it to go in the first place. Like I could be off and I call my best friend and I'll talk about some but the, <laughs> the conversation winds up in what I really wanted to talk to her about. And she check in and I check in with her and it feels really good to, to have somebody that supports me that way. I know a lot of times I am presenting to my friends like I got it together, my life good, I'm happy, nothing wrong with me. Somebody can ask me what's wrong and I'd be like nothing. So talking to your friends, I feel like that makes the, the friendship grow. I feel like it makes it better. I feel like you feel better when you feel like you can 100% be yourself with somebody and vice versa. So check in on your strong friends. Emma, if you thought one of your friends was overusing social media or involved in a dangerous online situation, what would you say to them? Not so much in an attempt to point out something that I'm noticing that they're doing that may be affecting them mentally and emotionally. But I would kind of start with the approach of sharing some ways that social media has negatively affected me mentally and emotionally. So kind of demonstrating an experience that I've had in my life and kind of using that as a starting point to kind of bring up the conversation. Because what you don't want to have happen is someone, especially a teenager or a youth, or even a peer, right, someone that you care about, to assume that you are attacking them or that you're assuming or that you're you know, coming from a place um, that is maybe not out of the best place. Um, so I would encourage you know, sharing personal experiences that you've had, negative, good, bad, and just kind of starting there to bring up the conversation. And I would always you know, encourage people who are in a position that they are supporting someone to really be mindful of you know, where that person is at mentally and emotionally because you don't want to do more harm by bringing up a conversation that they may not be ready for. So that's why I always like to lead with finding something that I can relate to them on and kind of using that as a starting ground to have the conversation. Great advice, Emma, thank you. And as we've mentioned before, it seems like just about every teenager is using too much social media. The Pew Research Center found in a new survey of teens using social media and the internet that black and Hispanic teens are likely to be on the internet more frequently than their white teen counterparts. The number of black teens who say they are online constantly is 56%. 55% of Hispanic teens say they are constantly on compared to 30% of white teens. 
So, Dr. Watkins, studies show suicide and suicide attempts are spiking in the black and Hispanic communities. Any idea as to why this might be happening? Well, this is not a new phenomenon. This has been happening over probably, I'd say, the, the last two decades. And there's probably many reasons um, that this is happening. You know, for starters, be, you know, racism, discrimination is stressful. And so being the victim of racism and discrimination, being fearful of being discriminated against is stressful. And that has a tremendous toll on someone's mental health. Um, as we are talking about how much time they're spending online and in the media, watching people that look like you, even if you yourself have not been the victim, but watching people that look like you be mistreated and again, be the victim of racism and discrimination, being barred of opportunities is stressful. It takes a toll on you know, your identity, how you feel about yourself as, 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 a, as a person, as a community. Um, that's all very stressful. And then when we also think about you know, the way in which we have allocated you know, time, energy, and resource towards um, looking at, you know, black and brown youth and what are their protective factors, what are their risk factors that are unique to them so that we can build strategies and interventions that, again, are unique and that work for them, that has not been the case for quite some time. I think this has shifted for, for sure. Recently, we are definitely dedicating more time and research and money to this, to, to the looking at this, but that has not been the case. So I think this is a number of reasons. I think then lastly, if we think about just systemic racism, when we think about where often brown and black people kind of live, play, work, and learn, you know, these places often do not lend to best health outcomes. Typically, the schools are underfunded and under resources. They don't often have, you know, clean, safe, green place, places to play and exercise. They typically don't have access to great health care. And then there's often these food deserts where they don't have access to healthy, you know, fresh produce and, and, and groceries. And so all of these things lead to kind of a decline or, or deep, more vulnerability to mental health issues. And Dr. Lewis, that was along helpful. those lines, mm -hmm. what do you think communities can do to contribute to helping more of our black and Hispanic teens? Well, one of the aspects I feel that is vitally important is bringing back a lot of peer mentoring programs um, because we found that with, especially with teenagers, whether it's individuals genetically born female or individuals genetically born male, we've noticed that they learn best from each other. Role modeling happens best from each other. We've also found that in regards to teenage boys especially, they learn better from role models of other men or other boys themselves who are looking forward to positive behavior. So that is one aspect that we can help with role modeling in those environments. And as uh, my, my colleague just mentioned, we notice in regards to food deserts, limited extracurricular activities, limited just areas of walking space, green space, those have aspects on reclusive, putting patients and individuals inside the home. So we want to create other engaging opportunities, forums, and different ways that we can incorporate technology, but it's not necessarily looking and using a passive way of technology. Incorporate them together and have different groups. Emma, you speak all over the country about this topic. What are you hearing from young people and others about, about our topic today? So what I'm really seeing is that my generation is actually very aware, um, a lot more aware than even my age group of graduating high school in 2018. I mean, growing up, I was very unaware, I was very naive, but it seems like post pandemic, after 2020, it seems like our youth and our adolescents are becoming a little bit more aware of the dangers of social media, but because of the pandemic and the isolation that they did face, it's almost, amplified and intensified the desire and the feeling of need to access social media. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword in a way because they are aware of the dangers, but at the same time, they are sort of addicted to it. And they do feel a sense of, like I said, validation through getting that sense of identity from their peers online. So I think it's kind of about finding that balance of you know, using social media in a good way to stimulate you in a good way, but also not overusing it and having, you know, the negative effects of overexposure to others' lives in the outside world. I, ha I have been seeing and hearing that, you know, a lot of youth are becoming more aware that social media is very filtered and that it's not really reality. But like I said, because of the fact that we have been sort of conditioned that this is our kind of reality, 
um, and the youth today really grew up with social media, it's becoming challenging to kind of gauge and monitor the, the use of social media. So um, we're kind of, like I said, in, in a position where we understand the dangers, but at the same time, it's hard to, to manage you know, the usage of it. Um, but I think um, really it's about finding that sweet spot, like I said, of not overusing, but you know, keeping it to where you still utilize it in some way, shape or form, because it is a part of our future. Well, you know, Emma, that's a great segue into a question we have from Jenny, who is watching right now. Thank you, Jenny, for joining us. Uh, Jenny says, and Dr. Watkins, I'd love for you to, to, to add your thoughts. Jenny says, hi, I'm a mom and DBT counselor. I really wish schools would stop supplying tech to kids to take home. It used to be introduced in middle school, and now it's kindergarten. Dropping my daughter off at school, all, you know, all the elementary kids have phones outside. It's making Jenny a bit nervous. Dr. Watkins, what would you say to Jenny? Or what are your thoughts on Jenny's question? Well, Jenny, I wish they would as well stop giving all of this tech to our kids. Um, and I think that we're in a place that we have settled multiple times that tech is here to stay, social media is here to stay. And so I think it's really incumbent upon us as parents and as schools to really dig into teaching and talking about media literacy, teaching kids how to use, you know, and be online safely, teaching kids how to vet resources and making sure that they're getting, you know, health information from reputable health sources, you know, art information from people who are, you know, qualified to talk about art, those kinds of things, making sure that they know how to report if they are feeling unsafe and also how to protect other people, how to report if they see other people being mistreated um, and, and being unsafe. Um, and ultimately, we want to teach kids how to begin to, you know, what we do externally is we try to monitor and limit, but how to, for them to begin to internalize that, how do they begin to now regulate their time on the computer and kind of hear us in the back of their heads. How much time have I been on here? Have I talked to friends today? Have I finished my homework? And also help them to begin to self, self assess and see how they're feeling while they're online. Are they feeling uplifted and revived and happy? Or are they feeling kind of, again, crummy, crappy and, and irritable and, and, and lonely even? And so we have to kind of shift a bit from um, not just solely focusing on how do we limit it, get rid of it, take it away, but how do we help them live with it? So true. Dr. Lewis, I want to share a comment on Facebook. Uh, our viewer says there's so much pressure for parents to govern kids' devices and schools give them out as well. It should be illegal. There is a reason one has to be a certain age to drive, vote. Uh, there are rules and laws that need to be made to protect developing brains and, you know, definitely in the state of Florida, sure. we are trying to do that, not in, only in the state of Florida, but nationwide. Right. What are your thoughts on the laws that are about to be made for banning certain social media, et cetera? Yes, so there are different schools within the state of Florida that have moved forward in regards to banning cell phones. There are some news reports um, that even the New York Times pulled up in regards to some schools saying Snapchat was being used during classroom. It was distracting not only the teachers, distracting the students' learning, and some schools have noticed that with the use of cell phones, they were noticing test scores or state standardized test scores reduced because of the distraction with use of phone during social media. So in regards to that, I feel that different states, different counties should look at it in regards to what is important with cell phone use. Of course, we have students who need it for emergency purposes and other things, but cell phone use should be limited during school hours to focus on education. There are some articles that teachers are now incorporating more technology and cell phones because they've realized a certain student population has a use of cell phones. They're, they're now creating grouped activities to look up information on the cell phone so that the students can get that use of looking up the information and then they have a box that put the cell phone away. So they're incorporating it into science classes, history classes. So I would say to, for schools and different counties to look and see how it can be used for educational purposes and separate the use for entertainment purposes. Mm. Now let's talk about combating this crisis. This spot from the Cleveland Clinic talks about the effect watching videos can have on young children. Living Minute, a look at the latest medical innovations changing our lives.
For very young children, it's the videos on social media that could be affecting their attention span. The impact of screens is certainly profound because what happens with screens is attention is taken away from face-to-face -face interactions and it's given over to a device. There are some studies that suggest too much screen time can make it harder for kids to concentrate in class or complete an assignment. The American Academy of Pediatrics says kids under four should spend no more than one hour of screen time a day and older kids no more than two hours per day. Well, limiting access certainly is the only way that I know of. All the conversation and lecturing of a child is not gonna do a thing because the captivation of screens is far more powerful than anything a parent is gonna say. Dr. Watkins, back to you and the banning of certain platforms. There is talk about a TikTok ban. Uh, children are on TikTok, TikTok, excuse me, more than any other platforms. What are your thoughts on this? I, I definitely think we should do our due diligence to protect kids uh, around things that are really target, especially things that are really targeting those kids. Um, but again, I, I think it is also important for us to be teaching them how to use it. Um, I, I think that, you know, it is incredibly reinforcing and, and for that reason for kids really addictive and they're not just going to in and of themselves just decide to take a break. And so I think that is a really important point that was made. But, but I think it is important for us to do our due diligence to, to protect our most vulnerable population um, from things that are harmful for them. And so whether it's a TikTok ban or not, I don't know if that is the answer, um, but definitely how we kind of make sure that we're addressing things that are targeting specifically young kids. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. You know, when we spoke to Michelle about her experience on social media, we also asked her advice for parents and loved ones. I see a lot of parents using social media as a tool with their younger kids, with their young kids. So when I go out to a restaurant, I see parents putting up a phone to their kids just to let me eat, let me talk to my friend, or let me just have a, a, a fun time in the restaurant. So you go to TikTok or you watch uh, YouTube. And they're, they're, they're not realizing how much of the lack of presence they're putting in their kids. So of course, when the kids grow up, they don't know, they don't know how to connect. They don't know how to be present. Emma, what do you think when you see this in a restaurant, young children being handed over devices? It actually breaks my heart a little bit because what I'm seeing is, you know, parents who are intentionally not being present in their child's life. And it's sad because, you know, you know that that kind of, that kind of screen time is really harming that, that, that child and their development. And so I always like to, um, like I said, encourage my, my, my youth and my teenagers that I speak to and certainly their parents uh, when they are present at certain assemblies that I get to, to present at, um, to be mindful and be intentional of how you're spending your time. I really think that it is kind of becoming more of, like she said, a tool that parents are using to kind of keep their kids occupied whenever they don't really have the capacity to take care of them in that way, to show up for them presently in that way. And um, obviously it's no one's fault. I don't want to sit here and blame or bash parents for making that choice, but I do think it's something that they can become mindful of, certainly if they are viewing this, this presentation tonight and just maybe something that they can make the change in their own life to maybe try and not be on your phone during your lunch break and maybe don't condition yourself to be so attached to the screen. That way it's not an instinct for you to hand it over to your youth whenever you don't really have the space to show up for them in that way in that moment. And you know, Emma, you brought this up before that one thing parents can do and anyone can do is certainly limit the time their children are on social media. The American Psychiatric Association has some tips to help define those limits. You can have your child track their time online and this will help kids understand how much time they are actually spending on social media. Turn off notifications and by doing this, they'll minimize the distraction and the frequent interruptions. Also, you can set online and offline times for using social media. Use a timer if that helps. Take a temporary break without any social media, whether a day or like a weekend or longer. Now, Dr. Lewis, are there any suggestions that you have for parents and how they can encourage their child to 
have a timeline to be offline. Definitely. So in regards to that, what the parents can do is most technologies now can share the screen so they can actually see what their children are watching. Um, in addition to that, you can set the timer for screen time for these individuals like Emma mentioned. And those are some key aspects and role model this type of behavior of limiting devices yourself because they're observing this type of behavior. All of this has been such great advice. I want to thank our panel for being part of this program and I want to thank NAMI Miami-Dade for their help in connecting us with Michelle and Joaquin. There are two very special young people. Also, I want to thank our viewers and I hope we shined a light on this problem and provided some answers. I'm Carla Hill and I'll see you next time. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel.